Hello and welcome to the first of my presentations to go through some old Protect presentations. Now these are uh, presentations that were done as part of the Protect conference. As you can see here, this de actually dates back to 2010. But this makes a lot of re uh, relevance to actually go into a lot more detail. In this particular one, I'm going to really dig into what are the operational aspects and way that a smart connector or connector works within the ArcSight infrastructure. So this is uh, first in the presentation of a deep dive on Protect series of presentations. This is the first one going into the detail around the ArcSight smart connectors. So without further ado, let's jump into this. Now, uh, I'm actually going to touch on a number of aspects here. We're going to dig into the architecture, really understand how the event processing occurs, how we can do network modeling and how that affects uh, how things are uh, mapped to the event and how that can affect the correlation aspects of things. And then we're going to look into some other aspects that you may or may not know around things like denial of service protection, uh, raw event integrity, and so on. Um, Clearly, there is no questions and answers to this session, so if you do have any questions, please do leave them in the comments below. So, let's dig into what a connector does. Now, it's a bit of a misnomer to think that a connector is just a syslog server, or it's just taking some data and spooling it to a disk. It does so much more than that, and we can see that here with, with what's actually occurring. This is a very high-level view of some of the aspects here, but we can see that there are devices on the left that we then feed that into a connector. There is a main flow processing, so that's what we're going to dig into where we do the normalization and so on. And then we have what's called the destination flows. So this is how we queue the data up to be sent to the individual destination be it ESM, be it logger, be it investigate, be it other components as well. So you can see that there is a number of stages that are going on where we get the original raw data. We then do the normalization, we do the categorization, and then finally the actual sending of the enriched events with everything attached to it. So there's quite a lot involved in here, that's, but this is just a high level view of what, what uh, is actually going on with the smart connector. This is a much more detailed view of the stages that are going in with regards to the processing of uh, within those, those particular event flows. So again, remember we've got the main flow and the destination flow. So the main flow is the initial processing and then destination flow is the per destination queue outbound information. Uh, and of course that could vary, but typically it's the same, but let's just uh, you know, make sure there's a differentiation here that we have the main flow and destination flow. In essence, though, we are doing all of these stages. So we're doing a level of pre-processing of data to make sure that we're getting it in, the, in a relevant format. Uh, we're doing the normalization of that data, so making sure that we attach the data to the correct fields, sizes, and so on. We're doing some verification on the sanity of the data. Is it valid? Is it reasonable? Do we really want to be a, uh, assigning this to a particular field? We can do what we call map file processing, so we can uh, change some data, override it, or even enrich further fields. We then go to the categorization. So what do we describe the event is? Is it as an authentication request? Is it is the outcome a failure or a success and so on? So we do the categorization next. Uh, there is an additional stage here to do with username splitting. I'll go into more detail around that. That's pretty specific. We also need to ensure that if we want to do name resolution, so looking up domain names and so on, we have a process for doing that as well. So I'll, I'll go in and talk about that too. We also need to do the zone population. So where is the uh, logical zone, logical definition of where this data has come from and how can we attach and uh, enrich the data accordingly? There's also the ad additional information to do with if this has come from a scanner type system, so a vulnerability scanner, network scanner, and so on, those events need to be processed in a specific way. So in if it's a scanner type event, we need to do some processing now. Finally, we got some filtering at the connector level, and then some time correction if we need to actually adjust times to make sure it's correct. And then finally, the event aggregation. So uh, in the case of aggregation, we can, if it's multiple repeating events, we can have that increase the aggregation by account by one, uh, but actually only send one particular event uh, accordingly. So you can see there's a number of stages that are going on within a connector, and it's worthwhile understanding the order that's going on and why we do these things in a specific way like this. 
So let's dig into the actual stages that we're going through. So the first thing to understand is, is pre-processing. Now, it, it's not always the case. We're not going to be doing pre-processing on every single message as it comes through a connector, but there are some very obvious examples. And a good example here is a syslog message. There is always going to be the initial facility number. So in here we can see the 188. There's going to be the, some form of timestamp in there. In, we're not always going to get the year in there as well. So we're going to have a level of processing in there to, to guess the year and so on. And we're also hopefully either going to have an IP address or a host name where this syslog message has been sent from. Then you actually get the message behind that. Now that's pretty consistent. So what we can do is we can do a pre-process on that. So we can get the facility we can get a, a timestamp and that actually gets passed into the device receipt time because that's the time that we received it. Typically that's the timestamp that uh, that we, we see there. We, we've also got some information here around the device host name as well or a IP address that we can populate now as well. So we, we're starting to make some guesses on some aspects and some normalization here but we're starting to be able to do some pre-processing on that too. A additionally there's for example SNMP uh, is a good example where we can do some additional device address because we're going to get that in the SNMP trap itself. We're going to get the agent address where it's come from. We can attach that to the uh, to the device address. So there is a level of pre-processing before we actually break into the actual processing of the message that we can do at this pace. It's like I say, it's not all messages, but just bear in mind there is a level of pre-processing that's going on now. Now we actually jump into the normalization and this will vary according to the type of the message, the me method it's been uh, received by, the protocol and so on. So in this example we're looking at pretty standard, it could either be a syslog message or it could be a, a file message, but we can see this is a web server access log message and we can see that we can now start processing this data um, and we can map that out into the specific fields. Now we use a parser for doing that uh, and the parser process uses a regular expression type mechanism. The reason for doing this is that we can actually compile a multiple number of regular expressions together to actually allow us to have a decision tree so we can process process multiple types of data that's received through one particular protocol. So a good example of that is syslog, where we're going to have multiple different types of messages being received from that point. But the point is that we can receive that de uh, actual message and then go through the regular expression decision tree to actually make an actual decision of what we're going to use to parse the data out. So it, it goes through that tree mechanism to do that, uh, to do that parsing. So this is just a, a, a very quick example where you can see that uh, we can process the data typically through a regular expression mechanism where we can see the, uh, in this case, the source host name. We can see some spurious characters. We'll take those out. We then get uh, a device receipt time, for example. We could override that from if it's received by syslog. Uh, we override that from the header. We can get some more spurious data. We can get the method, which is, says get. We can get the URL, which is, in this case, very simple. It's just a, a, a slash character the protocol, the device event class ID, so what is the actual message uh, reference unique ID, num uh, ID number, uh, and the number of bytes out, for example. So it's very easy for us to do that processing if there's consistency in that messages. Now, we can have what we call parser overrides or sub-parsers to get around where there's inconsistencies with the amounts, the fields, and so on. Now, I'll dig into much more detail around that with a flex connector session. I'll, I'll do some brief introduction, and then I'll dig into that and do some examples. That will be in a separate video, but just think of it from the moment here is we've got consistency. We can parse that data out using regular expressions. We can get the relevant fields and put them into the normalized field as part of the schema. So it's pretty simple. That's what normalization is doing. We do need to do a level of sanity verification as well. So, you know, we need to understand that there's some default fields that are probably not set. So, uh, for example, device receipt time, start time, end time, that, that will vary according to different systems, devices, and so on. Um, a good example of start time, end time is, say, for example, where a firewall or an IDS is given as a start and end of a network scan, for example, where it says it started at this time and ended at this time. We want to track that data but that's going to be different to the device receipt time. So we need to have a verification and a sanity check on some of these de uh, details as well. We also need to make sure that we've got some sanity checks and fixes on things like host names and addresses uh, and make sure that we got relevant data into that. 
uh, it could be that we get a host name that's been passed to us as part of the log data that's actually an IP address. Now that's okay, but the converse isn't. So we can't put in a host name into an IP address field. That's fairly obvious, but you know we want to be uh, consistent in our approach. We want to do, for example, uh, protocol name conversion if we can, make sure it's consistent in uppercase, make sure that we don't uh, attach and parse data into incompatible fields and so on. So there is a level of sanity verification that we need to be putting in place at the parsing process. Now that's different to some later processing around uh, denial of service protection as well, which I'll talk about later. There is additional uh, a stage of map file processing. Now it's worth noting that this is after the normalization, but before the categorization. That's important here. So uh, map files are just a, a comma separated file that allows us to uh, apply further mapping. And it, we can actually be very clever around this. We have what's known as a getter and a setter. Now I'm actually going to do a separate session on this and dig into much more detail around the power of map files. But think of this from a very simple way. Uh, and the example that's given here is, is a great example. So we're seeing what the destination port is from, from a particular normalized event. Remember, this is after normalization. So we see that the destination port is, say, for example, uh, 7. Uh, we don't actually have the normalized data that says that that's a, a, a the actual protocol of echo well we could actually set that so if we see the destination port 7 which is set in the fields we can apply application protocol to be echo and same with discard sysstat and, and so on so it's a really good and simple way of just doing very simple mapping and enrichment of data. Uh, and we can place those, and there's multiple levels. So you can actually have zero, one, two, and so on. The idea is, is that you can actually do lookups, attach data, override data, and so on. It's a very simple, very easy way of doing things. And there's actually advanced ways that we can do regular expressions and even database lookups as well. But remember, this is after normalization, but before categorization. So you can't do mapping on categorization at this point you need to do the changing of categorization at the categorization stage so just worth uh, bearing that in, in mind now we come to the categorization so this is where we need to understand uh, three key bits of information if we don't have those three pieces of information so in this case it's device vendor device product and device event class id those three fields must be set from the normalization stage and all the categorization file is is a, is a, a a zip file I believe uh, but you can actually see the actual file itself within the connector itself and then you can look at that information you can see what is attached to those so if you see vendor product and the unique reference to that particular ID of the message then it will attach the category object behavior outcome technique device group and significance as required now the categorization uh, is applied for standard smart connectors wherever we can as part of the standard ArcSight smart connector release. It is updated on a regular basis as well, so we do encourage you to do that. Now, if you're doing flex connectors, you may or may not set the categorization. That doesn't affect the correlation and capabilities of the correlation, but it's worthwhile doing that additional categorization to ensure that you have consistency in, the, in your approach and your rules and so on. So, just to recap on this one, it's quite a con, uh, complex subject and, and I'm not going to dig into too much detail on this one. But remember, you need to have those three set fields for the categorization to be applied. If you don't have the device vendor, device product and device event class ID, the categorization will not occur. That doesn't necessarily mean it still might not occur because if you're getting something that's unique and there isn't any categorization that's set in the CSV file, then it won't get categorized, but you will be able to see those CSV files if you want to dig into those and, and take a closer look. So um, just bear that in mind, now we've done the categorization, we've attached that additional information into the fields. Now, it's worth bearing in mind that, that there are additional ways to do that categorization. I'm not going to go into too much detail around this one, but you can do custom categorization where you can set that uh, and define that, and you can replace categorization. You can have the, sta the supported standard categorization that's applied. Uh, that's made available as part of the connector releases or the AUP updates uh, to content subscribers for ArcSight ESM as well. And then finally, you can do 
console categorization. So if you're getting those three fields that are mapped uh, and you, you're seeing that there's so no categorization or you're seeing there's incorrect categorization, you can, within the ArcSight ESM console, override that and actually push that categorization down, push that custom categorization down to um, the actual events themselves to make sure they're processed accordingly. So uh, this is a subject in its own. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but you can get the idea of, of what we're doing here as with, rega with regards to the categorization. Uh, I did mention there was another stage here to do with username splitting. This is very specific to certain situations and circumstances. If, for example, you're getting a destination username field when it's being parsed that's got multiple usernames in it, which is entirely possible. Uh, we do get that with certain log sources where it's generating that, uh, for example, an administrator user has created these usernames and it'll give a batch of multiple usernames that have been created. Now, in that case, we want to split that down. There is an additional process level we can do here. It's not enabled by default. You can enable it and you can define what the delimiter is, which in this case we can show that it's defined as a comma. Uh, it's actually in the, in the connector properties file. Uh, and you can actually have that broken down and have those multiple usernames available to you. One of the important things that we must also do here is, is have a level of doing name resolution. So we can resolve uh, IP addresses to host names and host names to IP addresses so we can enrich the data as much as possible so we can understand what's going on. So there is a mechanism, there is a cache. Uh, it, you can see that it's fairly simply broken down here. So is it in the cache? No. Then queue up a resolution, put it to the resolution thread mechanism, do that lookup, put it into the cache and so on. So th there is a mechanism that's in, in place and by default uh, it's set to be an hour uh, and uh, the connector will then obviously you know, use that cache to then uh, do the name resolutions going forward. Um, but we've had a number of instances where customers have, for example, had a smart connector and they've had uh, it, it doing mass resolutions. Now, I get that. That's an issue. You may want to turn uh, the name resolution on or off or increase the cache size and so on. It's all there. It's all available. Uh, it's actually available in the various settings that are uh, that you can see within the uh, the actual, in this case, you can see this by the destinations. So we can see the you know, enable name resolution, the time to live, wait for resolution, for example, and so on. So there's lots of settings that we can uh, mess with and use uh, as part of this. But just bear in mind that uh, you probably want to consider having that uh, name resolution enabled and you probably want to be able to ensure that you control how much name resolution is done and how long the uh, cache is retained within the connector as well as part of that. And additionally, for some situations, for example, like firewall connectors, you might want to turn name resolution off because it would be generating far too many name resolution requests. So just bear that in mind as part of the connector process. One of the things we also need to do is is do what we could, what we call customer and zone population. Now this is a logical model where we've defined uh, an overall, for example, in this case, a customer. They have multiple networks. Those apply to logical zones, uh, and then underneath you have the actual asset underneath. Now we want to do some of this actual mapping wherever we can at the point of collection. Why at the point of collection? Well, that means because. We can apply it because if it might change, a really good example is a cloud type environment where systems are brought up and brought down within logical zones and network ranges, for example. And we want to understand what that asset was at that time, not what it is in a day, a week or a month's time where we have to do the lookup later. We want to try and do that that mapping at the point of collection for accuracy. If we get it wrong, then we're missing a number of aspects around the correlation zones and so on. So uh, typically a customer is something that's defined for a managed service provider uh, if they're utilizing multiple systems in one ESM uh, environment. Um, there's no limitation. Customers can define their own customer URI. That's not a problem, but it's a way of separating at the top level. But it's just a logical differentiator uh, that allows us to to set those uh, zones and, and populations. Uh, a zone is typically defined as a block of contigu contiguous IP addresses that belongs to a network 
that you can apply a logical name to. For example, production network, DMZ network, uh, etc., etc. The idea is that you can give it a logical name that can be separated from its actual IP address range, which might be in a particular data center, for example. So it allows us to have a level of overlapping. Now, it's worth bearing in mind here we have the ways that this is broken down. It's worth noting that it's the customer is the top, then we have the device, agent, and source zone, the destination zone, device translated zone, agent translated zone, because clearly we need to work through address translated networks and environments, uh, and then source and destination underneath that as well. So uh, bear in mind, this is again quite a complex subject. I'm not going to go into too much detail. If you do want to go into a lot more detail around this, I do recommend uh, checking out the ESM 101 document that's available on Protect 724, which I'll provide a link to in the uh, description below. Now, you can actually set this at the connector. Uh, you can actually set this, uh, in this case, we can see this for the customer URI. You can have it for multiple customers if you wanted to as well. But the point is, uh, the idea is for a customer, we can assign that at the connector level. So it's going to do that mapping and apply that data at the point of uh, the, the collection and processing at the connector. So in this case, we can see there's customer URI, source zone, and so on. So we can do that mapping at that point of collection. It's worth noting that there are a, a way of processing these zones as well. So uh, there is a bit of an art to this, uh, and I'm not going to say that this is particularly easy either. But the idea is if you have a customer-defined zone, so your defined zones are pushed down to the connector. And, and again, this is just applied in a CSV file that the connector looks up and says, well, if I'm, if I'm in this particular network range, I'm therefore in this network zone. I mean, therefore, this is a customer-defined zone. Therefore, I apply this first. That's what you define the, the, the zones for. If nothing matches that, then it will look at the system zones. So what, what have actually defined the core within the product? For example, um, you can see what are predefined ones. These are all pushed down by default anyway. And then finally, we have the default zones. Uh, so anything that's overriding underneath on this one. So typically the RFC 1812 addresses and so on, uh, dark zone nets and so on. So you can see that there is a, a, a processing level, user zones, system zones, default zones. The first one that match, that's the one that's taken. So it's worth making sure that you do that matching and you define your customer zones, you define your, your, your DMZ networks, your production networks, and so on. Define those logical customer naming zones for the network ranges and make sure those are pushed down uh, to the connectors uh, because that's what will do the mapping first before it will get to RSE 1812 addresses and so on. So it's worth bearing that in mind. There is a very specific uh, additional level of processing here to do with scanner event processing. I'm not going to go into too much detail because this is really specific to uh, vulnerability scans, network scans, and so on. Uh, but the idea is that this is actually received as an event, uh, but then the, the systems will actually do some additional mapping to do with the construction of the URIs, for building out the information for the operating systems, applications, and so on. So, for example, if it's come from a vulnerability scanner and that vulnerability scanner has as, for example, operating system identification, it's going to apply some additional uh, URI information around the categorization for operating systems, open ports, and so on and so forth. So like I said, I'm not going to go into too much detail around this one. There is an, an additional layer that's done as part of the processing uh, at a connector level if the event is a vulnerability scanner, network scanner, or, or a scanner type event. We do actually have a level of connector filtering. Now, this is actually applied at the, uh, if you remember, this is the destination uh, processing. So we can filter out events by destination. Uh, there's some very simple ones that we can use, for example, particular severities that are defined for the event. Uh, also, we can do this uh, on user-defined uh, expressions as well. Uh, and we can also define uh, some additional aggregation at this point. So again, it's done on destinations. Why would we want to do that? Well, a good example is if you're sending data to uh, a log storage system like Logger, or you're sending it to a third-party system for an analytics platform, for example, like Hadoop, you want to send all the data unaggregated, unfiltered. Whereas to ESM, we want to send only the relevant events for correlation purposes. So there's no point sending the events for correlation if it's not going to hit a correlation rule or it misses some of the key information within the event itself to actually allow it to be correlated. So in that case, you want to filter out to ESM. 
but then you want to send all the data to Logger or to Hadoop or to whatever. In that point, you have these filters by destination. So you can define those filters and control them uh, very simply and very easily. Now, it's worth noting that the very, very latest release of the Smart Connector framework, uh, which is due out, uh, I believe, within the May timeframe, so it's May 2017, there will actually be a pre-processing filter. So prior to any further uh, processing within the Connector framework, so before any of the pre-processing, before any of the normalization, there will be a filter mechanism for you to remove data before it even gets to that as well. So um, that's coming in the very latest release of the Smart Connector framework. So we can do filtering inbound and filtering outbound by destination, uh, and you can control that how you want to do that as well. We can also do a level of time correction as well. Um, this really makes a lot of impact a lot of sense when we've got a global organization uh, where we don't necessarily control some of the time zones, uh, some of the times and some of the data center equipment. Now, we've always, always pushed for making sure that uh, customers use NTP wherever possible and make sure that you actually apply that across the devices and systems. Uh, but if that is a problem and we can't uh, do some of the um, uh, correct mapping of the times, we can actually do some overriding on this one. This is a very, very specific use cases uh, but it's worth noting that we can do some uh, connector device and time correction on this as well I'm not going to go into too much detail but the capability is done on that for you to to make those corrections to the times uh, I mentioned this with regards to the filtering, but there is also field-based aggregation as well. So we can group together multiple events that share same matching information. Now, you won't want to do this on everything, but it's a really good example. For example, if we're getting, say, uh, firewall data, NetFlow data, or anything like that, where there's a lot of repeating information within a particular time frame. So uh, where we want to keep something unique, we can have those identify those fields and then just increment the aggregation count by uh, a particular um, increment of the number of repeating field uh, number of repeating events that we've received um, I would note that uh, by default the normal uh, aggregation uh, when you just turn on the field based aggregation the normal uh, options that are available to you actually do give a very good level of uh, aggregation on those events themselves um, and it's worth sticking with that for most cases you'll get good level of aggregation by by doing that grouping accordingly um, however uh, what I would say is is, like I said, don't do this for everything because not all events are going to get uh, aggregated. And also do consider on correlation purposes. So you may be lacking some key bits of information because you've aggregated multiple events together uh, that separates those as unique. So that could have an impact on your correlation. And additionally, from a collection point, you're going to be grouping things together from the connector itself. And this is going to take processing at the connector level. And it's going to batch those together. So if you're doing this over a period of time, uh, then you're going to get bunches of data being received in a particular uh, time period. So rather than a constant flow, it'll be batched together and sent accordingly. So bear in mind, connectors will have a performance impact and there will be an impact on your correlation potentially on some of the unique information in there too. Just a few other important considerations to uh, take into account within the connector framework as well. Um, there is a denial of service protection called DOS protector that's built in. Uh, that just ensures that you can look at the individual fields, uh, that we can do some validation on the size of those fields and make sure there's no invalid characters within those as well. Uh, it is defined, it is in the connector properties file, you can see that. You can adjust accordingly. You usually don't need to increase or the, the actual sizes of the fields because that actually maps with the schema sizes themselves. Um, and if anything goes over those particular field lengths, they will be truncated. So they'll be matched up to that limit and then dropped from there. Good example is raw event uh, fields themselves, which are set to be uh, 4K in size. So if you try to map a 5K event into that, it'll do the first 4K and drop the rest accordingly. So bear that in mind uh, and just ensure that you're uh, 
calculating and managing that. But there is a level of additional processing to ensure that you don't attach incorrect data, overflowing data, or invalid characters into the fields that could potentially cause a problem at the ESM level. So it is a really important ele uh, element of the system, and, and you should not turn it off under any circumstances. There is an additional uh, level of protection. This is really only relevant to ArcSight ESM customers that are using the Oracle database backend. This is where we actually have what we call a device uh, side table, where we're keeping a, a side table within the schema to allow us to look up data very quickly. Now, what we didn't want to do is have those side tables expand uh, to be too large because that causes performance issues. So we'd have some limits on the uh, actual number of uh, references and indexes within that. This is not relevant to ESM 6 or later versions in any way. So this is only specific to ESM 5 on Oracle. Uh, so like I say, most customers are not going to worry about this, but there is additional side table protection that's built into the connectors. And of course, we also have the event integrity verification. This is an often overlooked feature that allows us to, uh, where we've got the raw data, so where you need to turn on the preserve raw event uh, and turn it on from default is no, turn it to yes. So that means we're taking the original raw event and putting it into a field called raw event. We can then apply an event integrity algorithm that actually does a hash of that uh, raw event field and stores it into another field itself. Uh, and again, you can change the algorithm to whatever you want to do. But the point is that th this is actually applying a, a level of protection on that data itself to ensure that your the data can't be changed. In addition to each event having that applied, there will be a correlated event for every 100 events containing a hash of all of the previous 100 hashed events. So the point is we can actually, if there is a change in, the, in any one of the events, we can actually dig it down to the the breakdown of just 100 events and then you can apply the hash on those two to check which one has actually changed accordingly so it's a really good way of doing things there is a tool that's provided that we can provide as part of that there is a command line tool if you want to do that too uh do be amount do bear in mind some log sources will not have a raw event for you to store. Uh, why is that? Uh, a good example, a database. If you pull in the data from a database, there is no unstructured data. The database that's returned from the query is structured. So all we're doing is taking the structured data and applying those into the fields themselves. So there is no raw event. Uh, so you can't use a preserve raw event uh, on a particular database log source. Uh, so just bear that in mind. And additionally, event sizes will increase if you're storing the raw event and the hash. Now, remember, this is a cryptographic hash, so it will not compress. Cryptographic data will not compress. Uh, so it will increase the event size. It will increase the total amount of data stored within the system as well. We do actually have a level of obfuscation with the uh, actual fields as well. So we can, again, look at particular fields that we want to obfuscate. We can apply a cryptographic hash on those. A um, couple of limitations on this. You can only do this on text field events uh, in the schema itself. So anything that's got a, a string type against it within the schema, uh, you can actually apply the obfuscation because it's going to put in uh, a, a cryptographic hash value, which is uh, alphanumeric as well. So you, you can't do this to an IP address field, for example. Uh, you can't do this to an integer field. Um, and by default, there is no direct way you can just unobfuscate it. So there's no capability within the console to just right mouse click and un unobfuscate. Um, there will be some functionality added, uh, hopefully in the later release around this, uh, around our data protection suite from Voltage that will have some of this capability. Uh, but in the short term, of course, it's a one-way hash. If you've got the original source values, you can actually run that hash value again as a command line for you to do that, uh, and you can actually uh, do the calculations and do that uh, reversing accordingly. So where we don't want users to see, uh, uh, analysts to see certain usernames, we can do that obfuscation. That does not affect the way that correlation occurs because it's a one-way hash. It will generate a one unique uh, hash value, which means the correlations will still occur. Uh, so that's not a problem. Just bear that in mind, though, uh, that it isn't directly unobfuscatable at that point. <laughs>
So uh, I've actually talked through a number of stages on this. Uh, I, I talked about the framework, the processing levels, the uh, the initial processing, and then the by destination processing, and some of the things that we can do as part of the, the Smart Connector framework, and how an event passes through those particular stages as well. So we talked about the architecture, we talked about the event processing, and then how that maps with the network modeling. Uh, we can talk. We also talked about the denial of service, side tables, which are relevant to the Oracle version only, and then raw event integrity, and a little bit about the obfuscation as well. So that ends the presentation. Uh, I hope that was of use to everybody, and I hope that uh, was interesting around the Smart Connector Framework as we took a deeper dive into the stages that are actually carried out as part of the Smart Connector Framework. Thank you very much for your time.